Okay, let's begin uh, the Nixon administration domestic agenda. We have already talked about Nixon and his foreign policy. So now let's talk about his domestic agenda, including Watergate. So uh, let's first identify what his domestic agenda is. And he calls this new federalism. And this is very much aligned with what previous presidents have done before with uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Square Deal and Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, and then the Fair Deal for Truman, and we have New Frontier, we have Great Society. Uh, presidents like to you know, brand their domestic agenda. And so uh, Nixon's brand is new federalism. And new federalism is the distribution of power between the state and the federal government. So federalism is that you know, state and federal government working together in this new federalism is the government, federal government at least, has grown so large over the past you know, 50, 40, 50 years uh, with the New Deal and then with the Great Society. And so what Nixon's goal with new federalism is let's decrease the size of the federal government and give a little bit more power to the state with things like education. Um, you're going to see uh, more powers delegated to the state. Uh, also, when it comes to civil rights, uh, when specifically we'll talk about busing. So many of great society programs are going to end. And this is something in common. You know, uh, his predecessor, Lyndon Johnson, was a Democrat. Nixon is a Republican. And you typically see when you have a party shift like that in power, you typically see the Democrat taking or dismantling the Republican programs and vice versa. And so how does Nixon do this? So he impounds or refuses to release 18 billion dollars to the states for HUD, housing and ur urban development, and to Jobs Corps. So he attempts to do this. Um, of course, Congress does not let him do it. He is not allowed to do it. And he ends up uh, freeing that money up. But it's just an example of something that um, he tries to do to really shrink the size of the federal government. And I think this quote here sums it up you know, perfectly. I reject the patronizing idea that government in Washington, D.C., is inevitably more wise and honest and more efficient than government at the local and state level. And so this is very in common with a lot of, you know, small government, uh, traditional conservative ideology. You're going to see this continue when Ronald Reagan is president as well. So let's just take some note of some domestic policy achievements that Nixon had. And some of these will go into in more depth in a little bit. But the first is going to be the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is kind of the irony of Nixon. He is somebody that wants to shrink the federal government, put more responsibility on the states. He doesn't want to create too much government oversight. But here he is creating a huge government agency that oversees now the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Mammal and Marine Protection Act. So he's really actively uh, protecting the environment. Now, uh, one could say that he did this reluctantly. This is kind of a sign of the times. There's an emerging environmental movement at this time. Congress is passing this Environmental Protection Agency, and Nixon signs it, um, albeit pretty reluctantly, but nonetheless, he does sign it. Next, let's take a note of Title IX. Uh, this is passed in 1972, and this prevents gender bias at colleges and universities. Um, in the past, uh, a male could say, oh, I want to take that culinary class or that cooking class or that sewing class. And a counselor could say, oh, no, that's for the girls. Or a girl could say, I want to take that math class or that science class or car mechanics. And the school would say, no. So no, you can't do that. You, know, you cannot have gender biases at colleges, at universities, in schools. And this opened up a wide range of females to participate in sports. Um, at this moment, a lot of females were uh, banded from participating in in uh, basketball or in baseball. And so now Title IX is something that a lot of people today uh, enjoy because it has that gender protection when it comes to schools, um, classes, as well as um, athletic programs. Something that happened during his tenure is the moon landing. And so this isn't quite necessarily a Nixon policy achievement, but it is something that happened on his watch. And it's really important because as we'll talk about, and as uh, we talked about in the previously, 1969 is just like 1968, a pretty tumultuous year. America is really torn apart when it comes to Vietnam War. Uh, they're torn apart when it comes to uh, race and civil rights, civil rights. And there are a lot of riots going on in the country at this time. So uh, this moon landing is something that happened that really 
brought the country together. 26th Amendment. This is a, an effect really of the Vietnam War uh, because a lot of these young men are drafted to go to the war and they're 18, they're 19, they're 20, and they can't even vote. So when the 26th Amendment is passed, basically as part of you know, the civil rights movement of extending the franchise, uh, this really does give a voice to a lot of young people who that's all they had been asking for for their country for such a long time. Another achievement is the National Minority Business Enterprise. And this is a way to encourage black owned businesses and hiring. And so Nixon is not um, against expanding civil rights. Largely he is for uh, having a lot of states have their own freedoms. Uh, however, he is a fan of affirmative action. Um, he is a fan of trying to um, create some sort of plan or program or office uh, in order to address a lot of the civil rights issues that have been going on for the previous few decades. Um, he also, and again, this is part of ex extending his base. Um, he also signs the Occupational Safety and Health Act, otherwise known as OSHA, and this is still around today. A lot of people benefit from it. And basically it sets and enforces safety and health standards for most workers across the country. Right? If you're look, working in a coal mine, there's now safety regulations in addition to those environmental regulations. Now, this is going to be really good for the workers and it's really going to be good for the planet. However, there is going to be some pushback here among big business and industry, and they're gonna have to get used to a lot of these rules um, that are, are changing. So let's take note of Nixon's record on environmentalism, because this is a perfect example of Nixon being portrayed as this wild environmentalist passing the EPA and protecting the environment. But at the same time, he paints himself as somebody who is definitely not a tree hugger. So let's look at one of these main causes. One of the main causes of the environmental movement is this book published by Rachel, Rachel Carson. And Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. And it's basically an in-depth look about pesticides and how they poison the planet and how they make people sick and how they also make the agricultural workers sick. So when this is published, a lot of individuals are thinking, wow, we actually really have to pay attention to the earth. We have to also pay attention to what we're eating because it might kill the bugs, these pesticides, but it could possibly also kill us. And that's not something that's good. So when Nixon launches the EPA, he does it in this backdrop. And you can see this from this quote from Silent Spring, which was published in 1962. The most alarming of all man's assaults upon the environment is the contamination of air, earth, rivers, and sea with dangerous and even lethal materials. This pollution is for the most part irrevocable. The chain of evil it initiates not only in the world that must support life, but in living tissues is for the most part irreversible. In this now universal contamination of the environment, chemicals are the sinister and little recognized partners of radiation in changing the very nature of the world, the very nature of its life. Uh, and so again, you see here that she's really laying the hands at you know, the chemicals. These chemicals are to blame. And really it's, it's our fault. We're the ones who are putting these chemicals on the plants in order to have this big agro business, make food cheaper and really feed the nation. However, it does come at a cost. So uh, we do have two sides of Nixon uh, when it comes to many things, but uh, right now we're gonna look at his environmental record. Side one is, uh, this is from a scholarly source. This is from a book called The 70s, uh, basically analyzing Nixon and these two sides that he likes to portray. So side one, in February, 1970, Nixon delivered a special message on environmental quality to Congress, drafted by Whitaker, the 37 point program detailed proposals for 22 separate pieces of legislation, including controls on strip mining and ocean dumping, pesticides, noise, automobile emissions, and water pollution. Nixon called it, so this is Nixon's quote here, the most far reaching and comprehensive message on conservatism, sorry, conservation and restoration of natural resources ever submitted to Congress by a president of the United States. So he is pretty happy with himself. Uh, and again, for somebody who does not like big government, he has a 37 point program with 22 separate pieces of legislation. This is something that is uh, 
a little bit out of character. However, we can look at side two. Again, Nixon really wants to broaden his base. He wants to appeal to as many people as possible as well. And he wants to say that he is doing everything he can. So let's try to reconcile side one with side two. So side two, uh, again, from the same source. Environmentalists and consumer protection activists, Nixon told auto industry leaders, aren't really one damn bit interested in safety or clean air. What they're interested in is destroying the system. So here, Nixon's really targeting the hippies. You know, these tree huggers, they don't care about the earth. They just want to crush me. They want to crush my administration. They're big anarchists. You know, they're rebel rousers. You know, he goes on to say, you know, they wanted the nation to, quote, go back and live like a bunch of damned animals. When it came down to a flat choice between jobs and smoke, which is basically the industry, he would not let nature lovers get in the way of a strong economy. So we have these two sides where Nixon says, hey, I have all this legislation. I'm signing the EPA. I got your back. But on the other side, he's basically telling industry leaders, don't worry, because I got your back and we're not going to crush industry. So let's look at the same type of motif that you see in the Nixon administration. Again, these uh, two sides of Nixon and how do we reconcile these two sides together. So um, Nixon uh, addressed welfare and welfare is basically public assistance and public assistance had been steadily growing from the New Deal from the Great Depression onward. Public assistance in the form of free preschool or um, the government providing food, uh, unemployment insurance, things like that. Uh, and Nixon, as somebody under new federalism, really wants to shrink the federal government and really get the states more in charge of federal assistance. And so he does so first by attacking parts of the Great Society. Remember Johnson's War on Poverty. And he attempted to dismantle the Office of o o Economic Opportunity. And this ran Head Start, which is the free preschool, uh, VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, which was a way for college students and college graduates to go to um, the inner city and teach people um, specific skills, um, get them signed up for college, and also the Job Corps, which again is a job assistance program headed by the federal government. So this is part of his new federalism saying, hey, states, if you wanna have free preschool, you go ahead and do it on your own dime. However, again, we have this side number two of Nixon where at this one, he is dismantling all of these government programs. But on the flip side, he has something called the FAP, the Family Assistance Plan, and it called for a guaranteed or a minimum income to every American family. Basically, the American government would say, here's $500 a month, or here's $1,000 a month, or here's $250 a month per person in your household. So this is a guaranteed minimum income. This never came to be. Of course, it never came to be. Otherwise, all of us would be getting checks mailed to us all the time never came to be, though it is important to note Social Security, Medicare, and public housing did in fact grow. So um, we'll talk about um, that guaranteed minimum income next with this thinking question. How is proposing a family assistance plan aligned with Nixon's plan to shrink the federal government? So this is a tricky, um, I will answer it for you. If you want to pause and take your notes and answer this question, I would do so right now. But by Nixon giving everyone a flat check, he then would cancel all welfare programs. He could cancel unemployment insurance. He could cancel um, Medicaid. He could cancel Medicare. He could cancel Social Security. He could cancel that for everyone. And that's the elimination of dozens, if not hundreds, of federal programs and basically putting the onus on the individual person. Oh, you lost your job. I'm sorry, I gave you $500 a month. You should have been uh, saving it. Or, oh, you have this large medical expense. I've been giving you $500 a month. You should have been saving that or that should go to the medical cost. So it is very ironic that by proposing this minimum family income or this minimum guaranteed income, he is trying to dismantle a lot of these programs. On the flip side, in his mind, and this could be true, um, it would make America better. That would address poverty. That would address the large federal government. It basically would kill many birds with one stone. But we'll never be able to chart the effectiveness of that because it has yet to happen. So let's talk about the changes in Social Security benefits that I had mentioned. 
under Nixon, Social Security and Medicare benefits increased to disabled workers and widows of retirees. Before the Nixon administration, uh, remember Social Security is this pension that you pay into while you're working, um, so is Medicare, that when you reach a certain age, uh, 62 or 65 or 67 or 70, uh, you'll be able to tap into that healthcare system that Medicare offers, or you'll be able to tap into Social Security. So it did extend because now you can collect Social Security benefits when you're 45 if you're injured on the job. Um, and also you can collect Social Security benefits if you were a stay-at-home wife and then your husband died, you can pull off of his Social Security pension or his Medicare benefits. So uh, we do have a, a weakening economy at this time and it's really slowing down, which is kind of scary because from World War II to about 1968, um, post-World War II to 1968, you have a, a pretty steadily growing American economy. The middle class is growing rapidly. People are buying houses. People are going to college. Of course, it's not evenly distributed among regions around the country as well as genders and race, but generally um, everyone is rising. So uh, a few reasons why this is we have this change in economy, is the Vietnam War, number one, right? It costs a ton of money to go into the war. You have these large deficits, deficit spending increases. Basically, you look at government debt in 1965, and it's there. We have government debt. By 1976, though, it, it doubles. And this is something that we are going to have to address. Of course, we don't really address it throughout the 80s. They balloon up as well. They balloon up in the 90s and then they shrink down. We have a balanced budget by the end of the Clinton administration. But then once we start the war on terror um, under uh, George W. Bush, then you're gonna see our deficits just skyrocket again. So we have this debt that needs to be addressed. Second, we have industrial, industrial changes for two reasons. One, these environmental regulations that I had talked about. Birmingham, Alabama, that um, city that was home to uh, the Children's Crusade and the letter from Birmingham jail. They're a major steel city. They're a, a new South city that really grew after the Civil War based on uh, steel. However, once you have a lot of these environmental regulations, you start to see Birmingham really shrink as a city. And a lot of people are moving out because the steel mill gets shut down because it's too costly for them to keep up with those environmental regulations. In addition to that, we have increased competition from overseas, and this is leading to a decline in industry. You see here that um, steel imports, steel exports shrank and imports increased. So here we have the imports uh, from 1960 and then from 1974. So our exports, which is here and here, our exports, our exports are shrinking and our imports are increasing. And so American business, now we're having to compete with um, India is a large uh, area of competition. Eventually, when we get into, uh, in, in about a decade from now, uh, from the late 80s, China is going to be a major competitor as well, as well as a lot of European countries that are now pretty successful and not dealing with the same issues post uh, immediately after World War II. Something that plagues Nixon uh, during his administration, and it's also going to plague Ford and Carter, is stagflation. So stagflation is uh, two things. So it is stagnant and inflation. So basically what's stagnating is the economy. The economy is not growing. However, we have this inflation, costs are increasing. So a good example with that, of that could be I'm making $2 an hour, 10 years ago, I'm still making $2 an hour, but 10 years ago, gas was 25 cents a gallon, and now it's 50 cents a gallon. So gas or the price of oil has, has doubled, but I have the same exact paycheck. And that is something that's incredibly concerning. In response to that, Nixon froze wages and prices, as well as discouraged borrowing, though none of this really worked. You have this shrinking of the GDP, with an increase of unemployment and corporate earnings are declining. So the economy is really ripe for uh, a lot of major issues. And this is really gonna come to a head during the Carter administration when we have an oil embargo. So in 1972 though, Nixon is president and presidents or first term presidents are really only concerned with one thing and that is re-election. And so hopefully you can see from this photo in the background, Georgians for Nixon. 
And this is Nixon's brand new plan. Presidents, no Republican had really tried this before. Nixon is going to be the first Republican to get the Deep South. Hopefully you remember that the Deep South is not going to vote Republican because of that OG Republican, Abraham Lincoln, who is this like northerner who was just super aggressive against the South and caused the Civil War. So the South for, you know, over a century, they're not going to vote Republican. Nixon's like, I got this. I can get them to vote Republican. So he has this Southern strategy. Again, hopefully you can see this far in the lecture that Nixon is an A plus politician. He is somebody that uh, knows how to broaden his base and extend his base. He tells people exactly what they want to hear. Um, and so hopefully you're going to see that um, in the election map of 1972. So in Nixon's Southern strategy um, to win the election of 1972 and also to change the base and get the South on to now a Republican platform, Nixon expanded his base by applying to these blue collar workers. And he did that by having OSHA, right? Having these environmental, uh, sorry, not environmental regulations, having these you know, occupational and safety standard regulations. He did so, hopefully you saw in the last lecture with um, the hard hats. Uh, the hard hats were these um, you know, construction workers who, uh, really defended America and, uh, on a negative side, uh, really bashed some protesters who were protesting against the Vietnam War and these hard hat construction workers were like, no, America is great and Nixon is great. And so Nixon's really trying to align himself um, with, with those individuals. He also wanted to appeal to Southern whites who had traditionally re re uh, rejected the GOP or the Republican Party as the party of, of Nixon. Oh, sorry, of, of Lincoln. And so in his first term, Nixon proposed conservative judges, Southern judges on the bench. Now, none of those judges ended up being proposed or approved of by Congress. However, just the fact that he was willing to say, I got you, I'm going to put Southern judges on the benches um, and the circuit courts and the Supreme Court, and I'm going to have these conservative judges. Don't worry, vote for me. Let's worry about the Supreme Court. In addition to that, in addition to that Nixon froze busing. Busing was a way to integrate schools. You have not a lot of people moving houses from you know, 1950 and 60 and 70. And so uh, you still have these white neighborhoods and these black neighborhoods. And so although schools are supposed to be integrated, they're not really integrated. Uh, and so busing is a way to take kids from the white neighborhood and have them go to school in the black neighborhood and take some students from the black neighborhood and bus them to the school in the white neighborhood. And, and Nixon, again, as somebody who is a federalist, says, nope, the federal government should not be doing this. You know, this is a state issue. We will not mandate busing. But there is one event that might derail Nixon's reelection hopes. And this is the Watergate scandal. We are going to talk about the Watergate scandal in great detail. Um, coming up pretty soon. One, what is Watergate? This is a very, very complex political issue. It goes beyond uh, just these dirty tricks that Nixon is known for. Uh, these dirty tricks basically being, you know, using the IRS and the Justice Department to harass enemies, to reward friends, to order surveillance on Democrats. Um, he surveils Ted Kennedy in an attempt to unearth dirt on him, who is this Massachusetts senator, um, and wiretaps his office. He wiretaps the offices of any of his political rivals or political enemies. They could be fellow Republicans. They could be Democrats. It is basically... Uh, the embodiment of scandal and corruption with really the sole purpose of benefiting Richard Nixon. Now, a few key terms that you need to know. Executive privilege. This is something that exists in the Constitution. It's the privilege claimed or that can be claimed by the president, any president, um, for the executive branch of the United States government. So the executive branch could be any secretary, secretary of state or, you know, sec secretary of education, secretary of transportation. Um, anybody you know working um, in the White House or working in the executive branch, if asked a question, they could say, I claim executive privilege on behalf of the president. And this is a way of withholding information in the public interest. And there's some positives and negatives of executive privilege. Positive, presidents need to be able to talk freely with their people. They need to talk about different scenarios. They need to talk to people um, like their attorney general about what's legal and what's not legal and what would 
the effect of bombing this city be versus bombing this city? Um, do you think that the New York Times is sharing national secrets? You know, so there needs to be some sort of secrecy when it comes to decision making. On the negative side, there's really no balance on executive privilege. Nobody knows where the line starts and where the line stops because there's no check. The president can just say executive privilege. Trust me, this is executive privilege. And it's like, okay, well, are you saying that to benefit you or are you saying that to benefit the country? And so that becomes a really tricky situation, one that has not really been answered to this day. Uh, next term is creep. So you're going to see creep as the Committee for the Re-Election of the President. It's CRP. Um, you might also see it C-R-E-P. Um, a lot of people and a lot of historians refer it to um, as creep because that's basically what it was referred to um, at the time, kind of in a tongue-in-cheek way. Um, these are people who we're mainly these plumbers. Um, these plumbers are former FBI and CIA agents who plugged leaks by preventing damaging stories about Nixon or who worked to discredit reporters. So uh, some plumbers ended up working for Creep um, and doing some of Nixon and his dirty tricks. And then when asked, about his, his dirty tricks, a lot of individuals claimed executive privilege. So hopefully you're seeing how all of these terms work together. So now let's look at how the scandal is going to unfold. So first, it starts in 1971, um, about three years into his first um, term, he orders the installation of a secret tape, taping system that records all conversations in uh, many of his work areas. So this would be in his office, this would be in Camp David, which is the presidential vacation retreat. And he recruits these plumbers to investigate and smear Daniel Ellsberg. Remember, Daniel Ellsberg was the person who worked for the Department of Defense and he leaked the Pentagon Papers. And part of these dirty tricks with you know, investigating and smearing Daniel Ellsberg was sneaking into Ellsberg's you know, psychiatrist's office so that they could steal files on Ellsberg or secretly record uh, their sessions and then leak them to the press and prove, oh, see, Daniel Ellsberg is crazy, uh, which is kind of interesting that your president is really trying to dig up dirt on you just to discredit you because you're a whistleblower. So uh, by June of 1972, so it's an election year. Remember, it's 1972. The election is in November. Five people working for creep. So here, working for creep, break into the Democratic Committee office at the Watergate complex. That's why this is called the Watergate scandal. Now, the Watergate com complex is in Washington, D.C., and it is a hotel, office buildings, and apartment buildings. It's this giant, sprawling complex. And they go there so that they can steal campaign secrets and they can bug the phones. Now, uh, when this is discovered, Nixon immediately denies involvement. I do want you to know that nobody immediately jumped to Nixon. You don't have the press saying, oh my gosh, the president did this, right? Because that's, that's really high up. Instead, there's just questions like, well, who would do this? What did they steal? What did they try to do? Who's behind this? But again, nobody's directly pointing at Nixon. Um, when asked, because this is an election year, it's 1972, you know, Nixon says, oh, I don't know what's going on. I don't have any idea. Uh, however, while this is happening, he uses his presidential powers to prevent an expanded uh, investigation into the burglary. He contacts the CIA, he contacts the FBI, and basically says, don't, don't at all investigate this. Don't ask me questions, just don't. Meanwhile, uh, Washington Post journalists Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein report on the burglaries, and they do so. They're they're not high level investigative journalists at this time. Uh, they're just two individuals who happen to go to the hearing um, about some of these burglars that are caught. And while they're there, they're uh, contacted by this individual named Deep Throat. And Deep Throat and Woodward and Bernstein meet up several times over the course of a few years in parking garages, you know, in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, um, and Deep Throat gives information to Woodward and Bernstein. So the burglars end up being tried uh, in 1973, so a little while later, uh, and 
after one of the burglars is found guilty, they say, okay, I'm ready to talk. I do not want to go to jail for Richard Nixon. Just so you know, the Nixon administration is behind this and they are involved. And this is the first time that a lot of people had said, oh, okay, well, maybe there's some truth to this. And they're starting to connect some dots. But again, the dots really are not connected yet. A Senate investigation does begin, but again, it's not directly connected to Nixon because the Nixon administration could be his vice president. It could be his chief of staff, right? It could be all these people around Nixon, but not necessarily Nixon himself. So let's take a little bit of a closer dive into Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. So remember, uh, there are these two journalists right here. Look at them nice and young. Um, they, uh, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein are journalists still, except both of them now usually focus on writing books. Bob Woodward is a prolific author who writes a ton about uh, political science. So check him out at the library. So they're work working for the Washington Post. Um, and the Washington Post is a pretty risky newspaper at this time. Uh, they're the ones who had just a few years before, right after the New York Times got in trouble for posting the Pentagon Papers, the Washington Post said, okay, I'm going to publish the Pentagon Papers. So uh, they're, they're definite, um, yes, rebel rousers, yes. They're definitely people who want to be a, a check on the government. Um, and this is Mark Felt. Um, and he is outed. He is currently at this time um, the FBI's second. So he's like the assistant F, um, FBI or assistant to the FBI director. Um, and in 2005, he says, yep, that was me. I was deep throat. And Woodward and Bernstein said, yep. And then uh, Mark Felt died three years later. So it took a long time uh, to actually uncover who deep throat was. But it's really because of these two's reporting, as well as Mark Felt, that we were able to really get to the bottom of it. But as we had mentioned, 1972 was an election year. Is, Nixon go is Watergate going to derail Nixon's reelection campaign? Heck no, it is not. Look at how red this map is. As you can see here, Nixon is the first Republican president to sweep the South, right? We have this Southern strategy that he is going to employ. He has 96.6% of the electoral vote. That's incredible. He has 60.7% of the popular vote. That is incredible. And this is what we call a major sweep. However, from the time he is elected to about spring of the next year, the Watergate scandal starts to unfold. First, a check noted for Nixon's 1972 re-election campaign went to one of the men arrested in the break-in. And so when that's uncovered, people start to think, okay, well, maybe Nixon's, maybe Creep is involved in this. Maybe not Nixon yet, but again, maybe Creep is. Then Attorney General John Mitchell, it was discovered that he controlled a secret fund to finance intelligence against the Democrats. Again, this is kind of getting closer and closer. White House counsel John Dean and Nixon discuss how to pay $1 million to continue the cover-up. And after planning this, two weeks later, John Dean begins cooperating with Watergate prosecutors. So you start to see this house of cards kind of tumbling down. Then acting FBI director admitted that he destroyed documents related to the break-in. April 30th, 1973, two White House aides quit. John Dean is fired and the attorney general resigns. And so this here is basically a lot of people saying, huh, we have these slush funds. We have him uh, you know, intervening in an FBI investigation. We have wiretapping. All of these things definitely lead to the White House, right? It doesn't take a mastermind to discover this. Again, though, I want to stress that you do have some people who are in their minds all blaming Nixon, but the majority of the people are still thinking this is his administration, right? This could be the vice president. Uh, again, this could be a secretary of state. This could be someone. But once you start to see these individuals flip on Nixon, it becomes incredibly clear that you know, Nixon's involved. Meanwhile, October 1973, so this is about 11 months into Nixon's second term, uh, doesn't look good for his administration. Vice President Spiro Agnew, who I think has one of the best names ever, he resigns as vice president, pleading no contest to federal tax evasion and avoiding bribery charges. So basically, 
I think there were like several charges of bribery and tax evasion and misuse of money, um, all these financial crimes that Spiro Agnew had layers and layers of evidence against him. And the FBI basically said, hey, Spiro, if you plead no contest, which is basically you saying that you're not innocent to just federal tax evasion, then that's it. Like do that, quit the job, walk away. Otherwise, we are going to put you on trial and we're gonna put all of these other charges. Spiro Agnew said, peace out, you know, I plead no contest to tax evasion, I'm out. Um, so at this time, Nixon nominates Gerald Ford, who is a member of the House of Representatives, Republican from Michigan, and he's the new vice president. Uh, Gerald Ford had been nominated because he was seen as this middle of the way guy. Um, he wasn't very right, he wasn't very left, he was somebody that had reached across aisles, he just wanted to get stuff done. And so by Nixon nominating Gerald Ford as the vice president, it kind of was a token to say, okay, I really wanna have peace with the situation. And of course, smile if you're corrupt and going to have to resign from office. Spoiler alert, by the end of the presentation, he's gonna be in the same boat as Spiro Agnew, which is going to mean that the brand new vice president, Gerald Ford, is going to become president without one single vote for president because he was not on the rep on the presidential ticket as vice president or president. So uh, Senate Select Committee on Campaign, presidential campaign activities into the Watergate incident. So let's look at what's happening in Congress at this time, or at least in the Senate uh, with their investigation into uh, Nixon and Watergate. So as they're unpacking packing all of this evidence, um, one, because you know the the burglar had said, oh, the administration's involved, and then John Dean flips, and then a lot of these administration officials uh, are fired or they quit, and now they're working with the Justice Department and handing over evidence. Meanwhile, while this is happening, Deep Throat is you know, sneaking information uh, to Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein and the Washington Post and publishing all of that. So all of this comes together, and the Senate Select Committee determines that Nixon discuss the cover-up at least 35 times. And this is key right here, this phrase right here, a cover-up. Nixon gets mainly in trouble because of the cover-up. That's the one thing that can be proved without a shadow of a doubt. Then his secret taping system becomes public. Why? Because a few people knew about it um, and they out him. And that's when the Senate Select Committee says, you need to turn over those secret recordings. And Nixon says, nope, they're mine. Executive privilege, my friends, I'm president and I can do what I want. So now this becomes a constitutional crisis. We have all of these allegations kind of hurled now towards Nixon or at least specifically in the White House. We wanna know what's going on. We know that there are some dirty tricks going on, but you know, we need those tapes. Uh, Nixon then fires the special prosecutor who is investigating you know, this presidential campaign activities into the Watergate incident. Uh, while he is doing this, he is saying, these people are against me. All of these people who are looking into me are against me. They're Democrats. Uh, this is very similar to when he lost the election of uh, 1960 to uh, John Kennedy. Uh, right after he lost the election, he says, the Kennedys are corrupt and they're against me. And there's this Baroque establishment and everyone's out to get me. Uh, so Nixon fires the special prosecutor and the attorney general and the deputy attorney general uh, resign because they're like, okay, mm, this is going nowhere. I don't want to be on this sinking ship. I could, you know, get in trouble if I keep, you know, with Richard Nixon. And this is known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Uh, it's never really a good thing to fire all of the people that you work with, especially when they have secrets on you. So again, this is very similar to the other cartoon I showed you, right? We have all this evidence here. Look at all of this evidence, right? Uh, 350,000 um, uh, in private safe, right? For this investigator, uh, secret Nixon funds, break in political espionage, right? And America's like, oh, I wonder who's to blame. I wonder who's in charge of this. And it's, dude, the evidence is all pointed right here. And then this cartoon as well, again, both of these are from her block. Uh, and Nixon is pointing to the GOP, basically the Republicans saying, listen, are you going to be loyal to me or that expletive deleted constitution? Uh, and what's really interesting at this point is Nixon believes that loyalty to him is akin to loyalty to the country. Because if you're against him, you're not patriotic. You are not for the country. Um, and since Nixon knows what's best for the country, everyone should just go along with what he says. 
Um, as this is all unfolding, this is when Richard Nixon gives this uh, presentation to the American people. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. So there you have it. Quote from Richard Nixon, I am not a crook. And again, what's really interesting is even after this whole you know, process is said and done, Nixon still says, I'm not a crook. You know, when you're the president, whatever you do, it's in the nation's best interest. And so it is a completely legal and the president is not above the law, but I know it's good for this country. And so keeping me in office and keeping me reelected, even if it involved wiretapping and espionage and these, you know, dirty trucks, tricks, that is for the best of the country. So um, these tapes. Nixon ends up having to reveal the tapes uh, and send them to the Senate committee and to the special prosecutors. And now we have a new special prosecutor. This pro uh, problem is not going away. I think Nixon honestly believed that if he just fired the special prosecutor, um, he gets a new attorney general, new deputy attorney general, then you know, everything would be fine. However, again, the press, uh, the people, they're asking all of these questions. And of course, at this time, Nixon thinks that the press, you know, they're a bunch of communists, they're out to get him, um, they're supporting these hippies as well. So let's examine public support for Nixon. So uh, in October of 1974, uh, does Nixon have public support for removal from office? Remember, impeachment is not removal from office. Impeachment is let's have an investigation and file some charges against him. And then, and that's what the House does. And then the Senate will determine should he be removed from office or not. So overall, 58% of US adults think that he should be removed. So most of them. But you can see that this is incredibly split along party lines. Republicans, only 31% of them say yes, and Democrats, 71%. So this is, um, by appearances, a political issue. Now, when Nixon does give um, his secret tapes, um, just mounds and mounds of them, and I'll show you next slide, um, uh, it's determined that there is an 18 and a half minute gap missing from the tapes. Uh, basically, somebody had stopped one of the tapes and then recorded dead air over 18 and a half minutes and then stopped recording and then the tape continues. And so the big question even still to this day is what happened? <laughs> Where is this you know, gap? What, what did it actually reveal? And nobody really knows. So thinking question, you know, um, before you move on, you know, would you support Nixon's removal from office? So let's look at this document. Um, and this is a summary of the evidence prepared by Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. Um, and this is basically a brief synopsis. Um, if you go to uh, the National Archives, you're going to see hundreds and hundreds of pages of you know, this investigation. And I just took a little snippet of it from you. So let's look at it. So in this, we have Aldo Creep, right? CRP, Intelligence Cooperation of Liddy and Hunt. Uh, Gordon Liddy was the former FBI agent that was in Creep, and Hunt was the former CIA agent that was in Creep. And just so you remember, CRP is also known as Creep, which is the Committee for the Re-Election of the President. So uh, there is no direct evidence that the president himself knew about the program, or if he did, that he knew that it had um, contemplated an illegal break-in and wiretapping of DNC headquarters. So. The question is, if there's no direct evidence, prosecutors would probably be looking to flip witnesses or to find direct evidence, especially since this is the president uh, and he had fired the special prosecutor and several people left. The question still remains, what do you have to hide if you're acting this way? However, circumstantial evidence and coincidences suggest the president may well have been aware 
at least that the you know, committee to reelect the president was mounting a quote, sophisticated intelligence program, including covert operations and campaign distribution with a budget in the area of $300,000. You can see that's probably a typo from uh, the Justice Department. Uh, so how did he get that cash? How did he get $300,000? Where is the funding coming from? So uh, at this point, you have tons of circumstantial evidence pointing directly to the president. But because there's a gap in the tape, um, unless you get more of these witnesses to flip, it's going to be hard to prosecute the president directly. In addition to that, the witnesses that flip could always, you know, Nixon could always say, oh, I fired them so they're disgruntled or they quit because they didn't like me. And so this evidence is tainted. So here you can see um, from this photo, it's 1974 now, and all of these are the recordings, the record recordings um, from um, all of the secret meetings that he had. And so Nixon's probably pretty paranoid by 1974. Uh, so March of 1974, indictments are handed down to seven people who had worked with Nixon, and Nixon is named as an unindicted co-conspirator. And basically, this means it is we're not indicting you yet. Like, we're not officially filing charges against you, but just so you know, we think that you're involved and you might be getting into trouble. So one of these, as you can see from the report, the um, at the bottom, you see my sourcing, is perjury, right? Including the president's direct and personal efforts to encourage and facilitate the giving of misleading and false testimony. What's else gonna happen in May? House Judiciary Committee starts impeachment proceedings against Nixon. So before May, you have the House mainly um, investigating. You have the uh, special prosecutor who is an independent prosecutor. Out, they're supposedly supposed to be outside of the Justice Department, outside of Congress, just to be this kind of neutral third party. Um, these groups have been investigating. You also have a Senate investigation happening at the same time. So you have a lot of these dueling investigations. But by May, the House is saying, uh, we need to start impeachment proceedings. And again, this is not debating about removing him from office. This is saying, what charges are we going to bring against him? Again, this is just the House Judiciary Committee. So this isn't charges like, you know, that he could face jail. It's basically charges that could eventually lead him to be censured or to be removed from office. So as you see from this document here, nevertheless, in spite of the generality of typical conspiracy law, there is ample evidence in this case to demonstrate that President Nixon took personal and affirmative direct action to further the conspiracy outlined above in each of its four most important phases. So again, the charge is not necessarily him directing all of the spying, but the covering up. So by July, the Supreme Court rules that Nixon must surrender all of the tapes, and that's where you see in that picture there. And the House approves three articles of impeachment. One, obstruction of justice, which is basically him trying to prevent the truth from getting out, interfering with the FBI, or possibly destroying evidence, misuse of power, and contempt of Congress. And so that's July of 1974. And this is going to escalate quite quickly. Before July of 1974, Nixon had said, I am not a crook. I did nothing wrong. There is this massive conspiracy against me, and I'm never leaving office. Spoiler alert, August 1974, he's the first president to resign from office. He releases the transcripts of conversations called the smoking gun. And again, he doesn't do this voluntarily. He had fought it tooth and nail. It ends up even being a Supreme Court decision, as I showed you before. And this directly links Nixon's involvement in the cover-up. Again, we don't have any direct evidence that he personally directed espionage or that he personally directed the FBI, um, but, but it's really this cover-up. So six days after the Watergate break-in, Nixon directed his chief of staff to order the FBI, don't go further, right? So we're obstructing the case. We're not necessarily proving that he's the one that gave the order to uh, break in. So um, right three days after this, that's when Nixon resigns from office and he says, I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interest of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. So now we have Gerald Ford, again, a very moderate, level-headed uh, Republican who likes to work across the aisle. 
He was not elected president because he wasn't even on the ticket because Spiro Agnew had to resign. So um, I've shortened this video here of Ford pardoning Nixon. Um, it's about 10 minutes in its totality and I shrunk it down to four minutes. So you're gonna see some cuts and some edits. Um, and of course the video quality is not perfect because this is 1974. But as you're watching this video, I want you to answer these three questions. What are three reasons why Ford pardoned Nixon? What does the pardon cover? And do you believe these are good reasons? Explain. And in the end, the decision is mine. To procrastinate, to agonize, and to wait for a more favorable turn of events that may never come, or more compelling external pressures that may as well be wrong as right, is itself a decision of sorts and a weak and potentially dangerous course for a president to follow. I have promised to uphold the Constitution, to do what is right as God gives me to see the right, and to do the very best that I can for America. A can tragedy in which we all, all have played a part. It could go on and on and on or someone must write the end to it. I have concluded that only I can do that. And if I can, I must. There are no historic or legal precedents to which I can turn in this matter. None that precisely fit the circumstances of a private citizen who has resigned the presidency of the United States. But it is common knowledge that serious allegations and accusations hang like a sword over our former president's head, threatening his health, as he tries to reshape his life, a great part of which was spent in the service of this country and by the mandate of its people. After years of bitter controversy and divisive national debate, I have been advised and I am compelled to conclude that many months and perhaps more years will have to pass before Richard Nixon could obtain a fair trial by jury in any jurisdiction of the United States under governing decisions of the Supreme Court. The facts as I see them are that a former president of the United States, instead of enjoying equal treatment with any other citizen accused of violating the law, would be cruelly and excessively penalized either in preserving the presumption of his innocence or in obtaining a speedy determination of his guilt in order to repay a legal debt to society. During this long period of delay and potential litigation, ugly passions would again be aroused and our people would again be polarized in their opinions. And the credibility of our free institutions of government would again be challenged at home and abroad. In the end, the courts might well hold that Richard Nixon had been denied due process. Finally, I feel that Richard Nixon and his loved ones have suffered enough and will continue to suffer no matter what I do, no matter what we as a great and good nation can do together to make his goal of peace come true. Now, therefore, I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, pursuant to the pardon power conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, have granted, and by these presents do grant, a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon 
for all offenses against the United States which he, Richard Nixon, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from July 20, 1969 through August 9, 1974. So, uh, do you buy it? Do you buy uh, why Ford is pardoning Nixon? Um, has Nixon suffered enough? Um, does that argument have a lot of weight? Um, what about how this would affect his family? Um, one thing to really think about is, would he have a fair trial, right? And this is actually a fair point that Gerald Ford brings up. You have a lot of people who are um, have, have picked their sides. And it's really difficult to have any trial immediately after, two, three, five years even after, um, about Watergate without people going into it automatically thinking that he is guilty or automatically thinking that he is innocent. So some points probably hold a little bit more validity than others. But what's also interesting is, you know, what does the pardon cover? If you were paying attention, uh, the pardon covers everything that he did or may have done or may have not done or who knows, big question mark, while he's president. So it's this big blanket, blanket pardon. And um, so I want you to, for question three, think about, you know, do be you believe that these are good reasons? You know, are there some reasons um, that are a little bit more valid than others? Um, on a side note, when Ford pardons Nixon, Nixon pretty much goes back to Southern California where he's from and he basically hangs out at his beach house for the rest of his life. He uh, retreats from public life. He does give an interview a few years later um, uh, that does kind of further implicate him into you know, him saying that he's, he's completely innocent and that's because it's impossible for him to feel guilty. So let's look at these effects of Watergate. Number one, we have this constitutional crisis, and this is something that really upset a lot of individuals, right? They might have said, you know what, Nixon, you're innocent, but you, you can't just pardon people, Gerald Ford. You can't just claim executive privilege. You know, a lot of these questions that people had never really thought of are now thinking, right? Does the president have universal power? You also have these questions about independent councils, right? do what is the check on the president yes we have checks on legislation right we have congress we have the supreme court but who is going to be this independent investigator so uh, we have the role of independent counsels end up being laid out and this is something that is used uh, for many of the presidents um, to come um, when it comes to uh, bill clinton and you know his extramarital affair um, and lying to um, uh, and perjuring himself to his um, independent counsel about his uh, extramarital affair. You have independent counsels investigating um, during the W. Bush administration, um, the leaking of the name of a CIA agent. You have an independent counsel with uh, Ronald Reagan when it is discovered that people working in the executive branch had um, funded uh, the Contras in Nicaragua um, by selling weapons to Lebanon. So you do have these independent councils that um, end up affecting many presidents to come. You also have campaign uh, reforms um, and Ethics and Government Act and FBI domestic security investigation guidelines. So you do have all of these guidelines. But when it comes down to it, the president's the one who is in charge. Right? The president is going to be the one who nominates the FBI director. The president is going to be the one who nominates people to specific jobs in the ethics department. So the larger question is, is how effective are these programs that are laid out from Watergate? You have to have some trust in the executive branch. After all, the people elected him or her. Um, but you also have to have some sort of check on them. Uh, and that becomes one of the lingering questions. So that's the end. Until next time, when America is going to elect a peanut farmer as president. Probably one of the nicest presidents in all of American history, Jimmy Carter. Uh, not that much of an effective president, probably because he is way too nice. But we will talk about that next time. Bye, everyone.